You're listening to My Comic Life on the My Comic Life Podcast Network. Welcome back to My Comic Life, folks. That's right. We are your one-stop podcast for all things geek, nerd, pop culture, science fiction, video games, comics. If you're into that, stop. You have found the podcast for you. Joining me each week in the My Comic Life studio, uh, folks, he invented the formula for adamantium. I can't believe this. He dropped this bombshell on me before the show started. Jaw was on the ground. The man who invented adamantium, Alex. Say hello to the folks there, Alex. Well, in all fairness, I was trying to re, you know, emulate the formula for New Coke. And for <laughs> some reason, I had accidentally... You know, constructed an invincible uh, alloy metal. So, you know, things happen sometimes. This this happens in the super science racket. So, uh, you know, you, you, you take what you can get, but patent pending. Sam, my friend, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Uh, went on a little bit of an unexpected, but uh, welcomed hiatus there. Had some, had some computer issues, but got them fixed and excited to be back in the studio with you. Uh, how, are, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good, man. I enjoyed our little kind of pseudo off off season kind of vacation that we had. You know, I know you folks down there have been just itching to hear about the news that comes along with the uh, the geeks culture. Um, one quick question, though, Sam. Uh, re- they had recently moved Free Comic Book Day to this past weekend, August 14th. Did you do anything or did you? Just, are you just hearing about it or what? Uh, sadly, I was not able to do anything about it. Uh, you know, there aren't a ton of comic book stores in my town and honestly, it just, it just crept up on me this year and I just missed it and I'm sorry I did. Uh, Alex, did you do anything for Free Comic Book Day this year? Uh, I actually did. I, I, you know, as you know, I visit the um, my my local comic shop kind of frequently, um, and uh, I did know that they did move it. I can't remember when it normally is. I want to say it's normally around Star Wars Day, you know, May the fourth, and they had moved it because of you know because of COVID, of course. But uh, I took my uh, my little boy. We went out to my local comic shop, my uh, vintage stock that's right down the street, and you know they had the uh, they call it the Jedi OKC, um, and the great, great people. You know, they had a big, you know, like a nine-foot-tall Chew- Chewbacca and, uh, you know, a couple of uh, um, Mandalorians, and uh, a lot of people were out there. He had a good time, uh, and, and for some weird reason, the only thing that he wanted to buy was the board game Trouble. So <laughs> that's what he came home with. What? But, you know, yeah, I, hey, man, you know, I got, you know, I had to go pick his free comic books out for him, and he just he just wanted to play Trouble, so, <laughs> so that's what we got. So. But it was great to hear that you had a great weekend nonetheless. I also had a great weekend, but you know who didn't have a very good weekend? Sam, would you please enlighten us? Sure. Uh, shots fired. That's right, folks. Famed comic book creator Rob Liefeld calls out Warner Brothers DCEU a damaged brand that cannot hope to keep up with its rival, Marvel Studios. The artist and creator took to Twitter to react to James Gunn's Suicide Squad. Now, the Suicide Squad's lackluster opening weekend has spurned talks that big changes will be coming to the DCEU. James Gunn's DCEU film opened with $26.5 million from 4,002 North American theaters and has so far grossed about... $72.2 $72.2 million worldwide. The latest take is that Warner Brothers do-over won't come close to reaching ticket sales of the original, which kicked off with $133 million and ended its debut with $746 million globally. Now, without violating My Comic Life's five-day rule, Alex, do you have any thoughts on Suicide Squad? Uh, this new one, I I enjoyed it. You know, um, my my girl, she really enjoyed it. Even my son, at, at you know, at three years old, he 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 still is like, I want to watch the shark guy. I want to watch the shark guy. So, you know, every once in a while, we'll throw it on. I I you know, don't worry. I always try and take care to make sure that I like speed past the super violent parts. But um, I liked the movie. It was um, especially with 
all the previews that we got. I know that you're you're not a huge fan of multiple previews, and you feel like they kind of ruined the movie. And this one did have its fair share of uh, previews, and I I thought we were in danger of it. You know, you know, um, kind of spoiling the best parts of the movie, but it was still um, very enjoyable. A lot of the stuff was still very surprising to me. Uh, I thought. Uh, without you know ruining too much, I thought that John Cena was probably the highlight of the film, uh, and uh, yeah, I had a good time watching. It. I did not go see it in theaters. I watched it at home on HBO Max. I mean, I pay enough money for it every every damn month, so I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna watch it. But what did you think of the Suicide Squad? Did you go see it in theaters? Did you see it at home? Have you seen it multiple times? Did you have a lot of fun watching it? Tell me. Let me know, Sam. Uh, I went on Sunday because I, and, and, and I went to the theater because yes, I had been reading about lackluster ticket sales and it, and it kind of broke my heart because I love James Gunn's work and I follow James Gunn on social media and he seems like a really great guy. Uh, and so I, I wanted to support his, his work with my, with my money. Um, I, I mean, I could have seen it on HBO as well, but, uh, you know, I checked my local theater, and there were only like twelve people in the theater. And the seat I chose, there were there was nobody within eight feet of me. So yeah, so <laughs> I went and saw it uh, in theater. Uh, I enjoyed it. I thought I thought it was really good. Uh, it definitely had that classic kind of over the top, but the the over the top that you love James Gunn style to it. Uh, you know, excessive violence. You know, uh, some really great, funny, quippy. One-liners, uh, just great interaction between all of the heroes. Uh, didn't agree with some character arcs that he that he chose for <laughs> uh, for certain characters. Uh, some of those have still got me scratching my head. But uh, no, overall, I thought it was a really fun movie. Uh, but I got to ask you, you know, did you see any major differences between David Ayer's original and James Gunn's new iteration, Alex? So I got to let you guys know, you know, I love our fans. I love interacting with our fans. Yep. And I like how they are so level-headed and they will wait until I completely explain my opinion before, um, you we're know, gonna, setting up the We're going to lose fans right here. <laughs> so <laughs> I will say I, looking back on it, because in, in the run-up to this film, I did watch the uh, David Ayer's version of, of Suicide Squad, and I watched, you know, Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, uh, and I will say that David Ayer's Suicide Squad is slightly better than James Gunn's The what? Suicide Squad. Yes, and uh, because I felt like this one, this one, while it was great, you know, I had a lot of fun. I watched it multiple times, but I felt like the previous version was a little bit more of a complete movie. It was like a tight two hours. Of course, you know, uh, of the three of them, I think Birds of Prey is probably the best. Um, but uh, I, I will say that David Ayer's um, Suicide Squad, I mean, it was, uh, there was a lot more heart, there was a lot more substance, and there was, like, story arcs. As you had already alluded to, there was a story arc in that that movie. I mean, it had I mean, Will Smith. You know, for one, his story arc and uh, El Diablo, his story arc with that. Whereas this new one was kind of the closest thing you had was Bloodshot. And that was just kind of like, uh, I don't know, it was just kind of barely patched together. And it seemed like it was it was done in reshoots. But uh, I don't like that they, they, you know, you and me talked about this off, off, uh, off, off cam or whatever before. But I just didn't like how they killed Flat. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me. <laughs> So we're not supposed to be spoiling things for you people, even though this movie has been out for, for two weeks or so. Um, I'm going to need one of those um, Sam Ballard uh, signature spoiler alert countdowns, please, sir. All right, so we're going into it then, I guess. We are, we are getting into the heart of Suicide Squad. So, yes, if you have not seen Suicide Squad, Suicide Squad yet, either pause the podcast here if you feel safe, go to your local theater. If not, steal, log on, or sign up for HBO Max. Watch <laughs> Suicide Squad and then come back and start the podcast again. Or just fast forward about, oh, five to ten minutes. 
uh, and continue on with the podcast if you do not want to hear any spoilers for Suicide Squad. We're going spoilers in four, three, two, one. Spoilers! Let's go, Alex. Okay, so I, not that I want to get into it because we can save that for another show, but it's just I the, the things that I find wrong with it, I can't explain without spoiling the movie. So they, they killed off a lot of characters that I really liked from the first movie and that was a huge disappointment for me and um it's it's just like i said i I felt like david ayers was a a little bit better it was a tight 90 or 90 to two hours long um i but there that's not to say that james gunn's iteration wasn't good in parts i thought james gunn's amanda waller was a little bit more ruthless than uh, the David Ayer Amanda Waller, and I, th- I appreciated that because she really kind of, you know, got things going, and and she never lets you forget that she was ultimately just like that bitch, you know. So um, that was definitely it, there. There are some major differences between the 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 two movies. I mean, did you see any of them, Sam? I, I mean, I I saw them. I, I'd like to know your take on it. Uh, I vehemently, I vehemently disagree with James Gunn killing uh, <laughs> two characters in this film. Uh, I'll just say I, I hated that he killed Rick Flag and I hated that he killed Captain Boomerang. Um, what else? Uh, I like Gunn's a, a little bit better than Ayers. Ayers kind of went down that wholly dark and depressing DC path that a lot of DC movies for some reason seem to think that they need to go down. Um, I like the more kind of light, airy, kind of joking banter between all of the heroes in James Gunn's Suicide Squad. Like when they accidentally stumble upon a camp of rebel freedom fighters and mistake them <laughs> as uh, Corto Maltese uh, soldiers. And I mean, in spectacular fashion, they wipe them off the map and... uh just a big reveal of that at the end is hilarious. And so it's for things like that that I liked James Gunn's better. Um, but I think you put it best. David Ayer had a little bit better ar- overall character arcs built into his film than James Gunn did. Again, it's kind of the fault I found with Guardians of the Galaxy 2. And once again, I didn't hate Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I really liked it, but just... I feel like James Gunn has too many characters to play with on screen and he's trying to do too much with everybody. And so you don't build as strong a connection with them, you know? So there are times when things are happening to these characters on screen and, you know, you just feel kind of emotionally unattached to it. Now, uh, that being said, uh, the, you know, the characters that James Gunn really did invest in, you know, Harley Quinn, Rick Flagg, Peacemaker, uh, dead shot, you know, I mean, like you, you really feel for these guys, uh, uh, when, when things happen to them. Uh, but you know, other, other ones like polka dot man and rat catcher and, you know, even some of the, uh, B suicide squad who gets wiped out in, in the beginning, you know, I was just like, okay, you know, it sucks, mm-hmm. it sucks to be you. Uh, yeah. Air, air made me care more about certain, you know, like the whole squad overall, you know, like. Like, he had, like, that scene in the bar, uh, you know, where Rick Flagg's pouring, like, every everyone a drink, like, right before they head to the uh, to the to the train station to fight in Enchantress, you know? And, like, that's that's a great character-building scene right there. Um, also, yeah, I, I just think Air had a more tight-knit Suicide Squad, not quite so many characters running all over the place doing so many things. Uh, but like I said, Air Suicide Squad just kind of went down too much of that, you know, dark, gritty DC path, which just doesn't always necessarily work for DC. And I, I liked James Gunn's lighter touch. Uh, didn't mean to go quite that far into it, but yeah, that's those are my differences, and that's how I feel about these about these films. Oh, I think you absolutely put it right that I think that the whole family vibe and the chemistry in David Ayer's original was a little bit better than James Gunn's new iteration, which is a weird thing to say because James Gunn is usually really, uh, his his kind of like expertise is being able to create that chemistry um, for everybody to enjoy. But having said that, you know, getting back on topic with what Rob Liefeld was, was talking about, um, 
with this kind of lackluster opening of, of uh, The Suicide Squad. And I think now uh, in its second week it had, uh, I'm reading it says an almost an 82% drop off in its second week. And, and only only pulling in like two two and a quarter million which is really some lackluster, you know, figures. But do you think that? Do you think it's because of the the movie itself that it's doing, so, like, comparatively so bad, or like Liefeld, um, kind of alludes to, or do you think there are other factors that could contribute to this disappointing opening? Oh no, I totally disagree with Liefeld's um, assertion that you know Suicide Squad is just another wrong step. For the DCEU, uh, no, I think I think the biggest contributing factor right there was you saw Delta, you know, the the Delta variant of the COVID virus, you know, flaring out of control. So many news reports about ICUs being filled to max, having no more room, uh, you know, and how you know like the Delta variant spreads five times faster. So I mean, this is keeping people away from movie theaters, you know. Butts are not in the seat. If this was just a, another typical opening weekend, I would see Suicide Squad making 100 million, you know, 110 million easily just in North America box office alone. And it had the potential to be, you know, once again, under normal circumstances, it had the potential to be like the number one movie two weeks in a row. Or, I mean, maybe, maybe Free Guy knocks it off and it just takes a slight mm-hmm. a slight dip to number two. But no, Rob Liefeld's assertion that like, you know, this is just like another misguided DCEU film that uh that is that is that is just wrecking the DC cinematic universe. No. Uh you're completely off basis on that. Uh the only reason this thing is suffering at the box office, like I said, is due to the uh Delta COVID variant. And also, I mean HBO Max and Warner Brothers have not released, you know, like what are the, or if they have, I haven't seen them yet, but like what are the streaming numbers for Suicide Squad on that service yet, you know? Right. What What about you, Alex? I mean, do you agree that it, it just bombed because the film is poor? Or do you think that, that there were other mitigating factors there? No, I, I agree with you. I think that there is, you can't really, it's not as black and white as it just being like, oh, it's it's not that good of a movie because that's not the case. It is a good movie when it, and, it, and it definitely warrants multiple viewings. But like you said, there is the, you know, COVID is kind of ramping back up and that's getting in people's minds. There's the fact that, you know, I'm not going to pack my whole family up and we're not going to go watch an R-rated movie in the movie theater. That That's also, you know, got to be there. Um, and it's just, you know, Suicide Squad, I think that they may have bet too much on, you know, Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, the draw that she could have with audiences, or Idris Elba, his draw that he could have, you know, with, with audiences, and we're talking about your casual audience, because I know that these people have, you know, on the internet, they're super famous, but we're talking... Well, like at least that's like twenty five percent of their of their target audience, and it's you know, so maybe on paper, on paper this looked like it was just going to be a smash hit, but when it ultimately came down to it, there were just too many factors that were going against it to uh, prevent it from from actually you know, um, going gangbuster and becoming that summer blockbuster that that uh, Warner Brothers and DC EU was hoping that it would be. Uh, again, I have to stress, you know, I can't stress it enough that, that this is, is a good movie, and I urge everybody, if you're listening, go watch it, because it is worth at least one watch. I don't care whether you watch it on HBO, in the theater, you know, or, or, or however you watch it, but I don't, I don't understand where this is coming from with Liefeld, and why, uh, and maybe it's from, you know, maybe he wants Deadpool to be the only successful R-rated comic book type of uh, property, but I just, um, I definitely don't see it his way, and uh, and it's it's, just, it's really a shame that he's not kind of getting. He's entitled to his opinion, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I think he's wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, Liefeld went on to say, uh, unfortunately, DC is just a damaged brand at this point. 
Marvel has pulled away in such spectacular fashion and DC has lost ground on all platforms. Get rid of everyone top to bottom. Start over. Make no doubt The Suicide Squad is a great film. James Gunn added much style and heart. The problem is deeper beyond the pandemic and streaming. Uh, do you agree with Liefeld's take? Does Warner Brothers need to make some drastic changes to compete with Marvel? Uh, this, I mean, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I do kind of agree with him. Uh, and, and not just be based off of this movie alone. I, I feel like uh, Warner has made a, not a lot, but kind of a lot of key mistakes when it comes to trying to get this universe off the ground. And I, I, from some of the rumors that I hear with this, you know, with this Flash movie um, and uh, with a couple of other properties that they have, I, I hear that they are trying to right the ship. But um, I think they ultimately do need to make a couple of really drastic changes. And maybe that comes from the top down. Maybe they, you know, like you like to say, back the dump truck full of money up to Kevin Feige and kind of try and steal him from Marvel and Disney and uh, get him to just give him free range of this. Or if they, you know, it uh, again, you know, going with the internet audience, if they do um, kind of like beg Zack Snyder to come back to the universe and uh, finish his vision, but... Uh, something's got to something's got to change, um, especially with a lot of their big uh, their big properties like your 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 Supermans. Um, this last Wonder Woman wasn't great. Uh, Shazam's good. I feel like Aquaman's pretty good, and, and you know, but um, I feel like there is room for improvement in and Lifefield is right that they are getting slaughtered by Marvel when it comes to these big um, productions, like these big movie productions. But when you look at it from, like, on uh, in, in the comic books, in animated animation and everything like that, DC is, you know, gaining ground in those, uh, in, in those um, mediums. So it's not all about movies, people. Uh, so we need to kind of remember that. And DC's going to get there eventually. I think eventually they're going to be, you know, pumping out some really good story, whether that be from people getting Marvel fatigue or from them actually making a lot of really good decisions. It, it, it It's going to happen eventually. But uh, I, I have to bounce that question back to you, my friend Sam. Do you do you agree with Liefeld, Liefeld's take or... Or do you feel like, you know, Warner is kind of needs to just kind of stay the course and not make too many drastic changes to compete with Marvel? No, I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of thought this for a while, and I agree. Uh, Warner Brothers needs to keep its cast that it has because it has built some great actors into those roles. So, I mean, like, you know, keep Cavill, keep Affleck, um, you know, keep Momoa, keep Gal Gadot, like, keep... Your Superman, your Batman, your Aquaman, like like your Wonder Woman, like keep them there. Yes, I mean you have great actors who really are doing the best um, um, they can to uh, to bring these characters to life. Uh, what what is always lacking to me up until like Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and Shazam? What was lacking for me in like a lot of these films though? was levity you know i mean like like mm -hmm. like go back and look at like the christopher reeves superman i mean like there were some genuinely like funny moments where you like you'll see reeve you know kind of stumbling and bumbling around as clark kent uh and then changing into this totally confident and strong superhero as superman uh but but i mean even even the 89 tim burton batman had some levity had some fun and it, you know, like, like, like it wasn't all so dark and gritty. Uh, I don't know why Warner Brothers decided to like make more of their superhero films dark and gritty, and they're starting to get away from it. And I, I think they need to do that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, like, if you if you want to take the Flashpoint movie and you know, sort of like reboot the DC universe, <clears throat> jumping off that Flashpoint movie, I'm totally fine with that. Just don't go making major changes to your actors because people like the actors that you have filling out these roles, they just want to see a little bit more of a lighter tone 
from these films, uh, and so do I a little bit too. I mean, I don't want to see, you know, Batman, you know, can't be 1960s, you know, dancing around or anything <laughs> by any means. I mean, don't go that light, you know. But I mean, even even the Nolan films, you know, had some had some funny moments in them where like I laughed out loud. Uh, you know, it's so it's okay to laugh in a in a superhero film, and I think we're starting to see that change on because you know you know like I said, look at Wonder Woman. Uh, it kind of starts there, like that was a much more lighter but still great, strong, powerful superhero film, but just not as gritty, dark, and depressing as you know its previous. Uh, predecessors and then you know like uh it kind of grows in aquaman a little bit and it really grows in shazam shazam's just hilarious and like like i said i'm not saying you have to be funny but like allow your audience to breathe a little bit you know don't just have an elephant sit on their chest for 90 minutes and go you liked it right no (laughs) um yeah i I I 100 percent agree with you on that i i i uh i I I cannot agree more with your take that you know these the the actors and actresses that they cast for these roles are damn near perfect, um, all except for that dude that they cast as the Flash. But we can get into <laughs> different. Ezra course, Ez- anytime, Ezra Miller. <clears throat> Ezra Miller, yes, okay, whatever his name is, um, but. And of course, you know, whenever they cast a Batman, there's always going to be huge arguments over whether they're going to be good or not, but. Uh, like you said, the the casting is there, the the stories are certainly there. They have a, you know a plethora of, of different kind of story arcs that they could choose from, but for some reason or another, like you said, they they had just kind of committed to this kind of dark tone. And with that dark tone, when they do try to inject some levity into it, it it just it's it's misplaced and it doesn't really it stands out like a sore thumb kind of where you're just like, okay. And it kind of takes you out of that moment. So I, I do feel like they need to, um, they could use, definitely use this flashpoint movie as a kind of, um, soft reboot of the universe. That would be kind of cool. But, uh, hopefully, you know, we, we get to see some really good, good, um, movies coming from DC and, and Marvel together because I enjoy, I enjoy both. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I think I think you pointed it out best. I mean, basically, I mean, Disney bought Marvel, but they don't try to influence Marvel all that much. I mean, like, they let Kevin Feige run Marvel and, like, run the MCU as he sees fit, you know? And that has worked out so well for them, uh, you know, or at least from, like, what I read. Like, there's minimal... Disney studio interference. Now, does Marvel sometimes, you know, interfere in their films? Yes, but I mean, like, Disney is not butting in. Like, like you know, they just kind of back off and let Marvel run itself. And I think that's another problem Warner Brothers has run into. It's a, they don't have a Kevin Feige guy. So you got all these studio heads butting into, like, you know, parts of these films. And I think that's kind of, like, you know, hurting them. Like, they need, like, one official person, you know... And it like like DC needs to stand alone from Warner Brothers and you know just create the films and just have them released under the Warner Brothers umbrella. If you if you catch my drift there, absolutely. And and it, if that is what Rob Liefeld's um, point he's trying to make, then I guess we do agree with that. But regardless of his take on James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, he did mention that he was looking forward to uh, the upcoming Peacemaker regardless, and we are as well here on My Comic Life. So absolutely stay tuned to any kind of news that you might be looking for when it comes to more from the DCEU. Yes. Uh, Moving over to a a highly anticipated segment here. <laughs> uh, we, we, we started this new segment on this show, Agree or Disagree. Uh, last time we recorded, we started, uh, yes, this special segment, again, called Agree or Disagree, wherein we looked over controversial hot takes pertaining to movies related to Marvel comic, Marvel comic properties. The rules are simple. There's a list of controversial statements in regards to the subject. We flip a coin to see who goes first. The winner of the coin flip gets to pick a statement and either agree or disagree with it. And the other then has to argue the other side in good faith before the roles are reversed. Now, 
since we covered Marvel movies last time, this week we are turning our attention to the DCEU. Alex, do you do you have the coin ready? I have the coin. Would you just run down really quick what the uh, what the list of uh, hot takes is? Sure. Uh, so, and feel free to co- uh, make your own comments in our edit in our comment section on our Facebook page on our YouTube channel. Let us know what you think. But the hot takes are: Green Lantern wasn't that bad. A Joker movie that has nothing to do with Batman is worthless. <laughs> Superman the movie not nearly as good as its reputation. Burton's Batman movies are not even about Batman. If it weren't for the Ares fight, Wonder Woman would have been the best superhero movie of all time. Shazam! Is the best constructed (laughs) DC movie by a lot. Batman Sub-Zero is better than Batman Mask of the Phantasm. (laughs) Uh, For the most part, the DCEU muscle suits look ridiculous. Aquaman was meh. Uh, <laughs> Snyderverse ruined the DCEU. Jared Leto is the best looking Joker so far. And finally, Batman and Robin is more rewatchable than The Dark Knight Rises. Dude, I nearly vomited saying some of those. I, I like them, dude. All right. I have the coin in hand. I'm going to flip them. Please call it in the air. All right. I'm going to call heads. It is heads. God damn it. All right, whatever. Go first. (laughs) Green Lantern wasn't that bad of a movie, Alex. (laughs) Uh, Disagree. While I love Ryan Reynolds, oh my gosh, Green Lantern was not a good movie. It was so middle of the ground, meh. I can't even begin. First of all, you should have learned from Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. You can't have a cloud-based villain. It hasn't been successful. It doesn't work at all. Uh, Giving Hector Hammond a swollen head uh, didn't do anything for me. A heavily CGI'd suit, blah, and the best Green Lantern could come up with to save a crashing helicopter was a Micro Machines track on a car. <laughs> really? Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that being said, the training sequence on Oa was pretty cool. And uh, the voice of Michael Clark Duncan on, and I'm blanking on his name, uh, but the big... Kilowog. Kilowog, thank you. Uh, that one was pretty good. Uh, you should have explored the Yellow Lanterns more. That would have made for more... Um, Watching Mark Strong, I, I believe is is the actor's name, uh, yes. lose lose faith in the power of green light, and you know find find more power in the in the yellow light of fear would have been a much more fascinating movie, and you know to to see him go bad at the end and then fight Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern that should have been your story the Hector Hammond fear based you know oh my gosh you know. I mean, it, the main villain just looked like he had a bad tumor or headache throughout the entire film, and then he, and 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 then he becomes a cloud at the end. No, Green Lantern was not that great of a superhero film. Go, Alex. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you could do this, man. I'm sitting here slapping myself in the mirror. All right. Uh, it it wasn't that bad, honestly. I mean, you got to think of the, uh, the the cast list that they had. If it weren't for a few kind of hiccups in the script, this is a pretty strong movie on paper. You got Ryan Reynolds, uh, Blake Lively, as you already mentioned, Mark Strong, who was a fantastic as Sinestro. I think he was probably one of the best uh, DC villains that they haven't kind of flushed out, and I would love to see more of him in uh, further uh, properties. You had uh, a very young in his career, Taika Waititi. Uh, you had Peter Sarsgaard. Angela Bassett played, this was your introduction to Amanda Waller. They had Tim Robbins. They had Tamura Morrison as Abin Sur, as you had already talked. Michael Clark Duncan was playing Kilowog. Jeffrey Rush was in the movie. So it's like the bones are there as they, as they say you know when they when they're doing the house renovations and stuff this this movie has good bones it was just a few of the kind of like there was a lot of hiccups with the um with the script 
that is not this movie is a very tight two hours and it's over with there's no loose ends it's it's nice and wrapped up the um you know the story arc but that that ryan reynolds has is really great he goes from being this hotshot pilot who doesn't you know doesn't give a fl- give a flip to somebody who can actually um kind of sacrifice themselves for the greater good uh it was you know i you know go back and watch it man it, it's not as bad as you think it is <laughs> and i uh yes the suit is pretty bad the whole like basically painted on to a naked body kind of suit was was bad but that's only because it was comic accurate you know so um definitely go back and revisit it and it wasn't that bad i'm done all right that's (laughs) that's what it is (laughs) all right not bad not bad yeah you know what hey i i like to you know I'll, i'll drink to that um let's see my first one i think i'm gonna say batman's uh, Burton's Batman movies are not even about Batman. I 100% agree with this one, dude. Like, the first... Batman 89 should have just been called Joker. And Batman Returns should have just been called Penguin. Because that is exactly who they are about. There is no reason that you should see more... I mean, I get it that, that Batman is the best because his villains are the best. But there is no reason that you should see more of the villain in a Batman movie than Batman. That's that's who I came to see. That's who I want to see. That's who everybody's there to see. Um, not taking away from, you know, Nicholson's performance, which is, you know, all time. And even Danny DeVito's performance or Michelle Pfeiffer's performance, which are, you know, both all time. But at the same time, it's just like you don't get enough Batman in those movies. It's all about... Um, Bruce Wayne and it just uh, that to me that is the bane of of, you know a little joke there but that is kind of the bane of these Batman movies is that we spend too much time in Bruce Wayne's life or not even with with neither Bruce Wayne or Batman on screen and it it really takes it away because that's who I paid to see go ahead Sam have a lot of fun <laughs> arguing this. I, I'm a softball pitch this one in there for you. Go ahead. I was about to say, erroneous horseshit on all accounts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, man. Bat, Burton's Batman films are totally all about Batman. Oh, my gosh. Let's start with the 89 Batman. You get that great, awesome opening scene where, like, the two thugs mug the family in the alleyway much like you know batman's family was almost gunned down and they're up on the roof and they're like the bat the bat that's all that crap you know there ain't no bat and all of a sudden who shows up batman in all of his fucking glory the keats (laughs) swoops in and delivers that line to the piss scared thug who are you i'm batman you know i mean it (laughs) was awesome and no I mean, yes, while Jack Nicholson is a nightmare-inducing joker, just ask my therapist about that one. Um, (laughs) uh, No, you get equal times between both Nicholson's Joker and Batman. You do not get more time with one than the other. They're totally equal. And plus, you get in a subplot of how Jack Nicholson, spoiler, spoiler alert here for a film that came out in 89, But sure, about how Jack Napier is the man who gunned down Bruce's parents in Crime Alley. So it makes their ultimate fight at the end just that much more special. You get to see how Batman accidentally turns Jack Napier into the Joker. And they they share equal screen time. In fact, usually you don't usually see the Joker, you know, solo too much on, on his own. And I mean, so yeah, you get the great... Um, art museum scene, you know, like where like he gasses everybody to death and busts in and, you know, takes, you know, and messes up all those great work of arts. But then you get that fantastic scene, you know, a counterpoint to that. Batman comes in through that skylight, grabs, you know, the hot looking Kim Basinger, you know, you know, hugs her tight to her hip and tells her to hold on. And he, you know, uh, zip lines them out of the art museum and the Joker goes, <laughs> where does he get those wonderful toys from? And then you get the great Batmobile chase through Gotham. So no, 
don't even start with me that Burton's films are all about the <laughs> villain. It's all point counterpoint. You get one scene with Jack Napier, you get another scene with Bruce Wayne, you get two scenes with the Joker, you get two scenes with the Batman. Now let's move over to the Penguin. You want to go there? Great. The Penguin's goons show up to trash the lighting of the tree. That is fucking awesome. But you know what? You get Batman, and once again, showing up in the Batmobile after Gordon says send the signal, and you get what was to me a way too obvious, you know, hey, look, there's a bat signal hanging off Wayne Manor, but you see the bat <laughs> signal shine on Bruce Wayne's face, and he stands up, and he becomes the fucking Batman that we love, and he races to Gotham, and he fights all the circus villains, um, and you get some great scenes between Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle, but then you get some great fight scenes on the rooftop between all three villains, and oh my gosh, the Batmobile chase when the Penguin takes over the Batmobile. And this one is even better because everything is miswired. And you don't know whether or not, you know, he's going to make it out alive or the Batmobile is going to blow up. So, no, there is equal time given to both Bruce Wayne, Batman, and his villains in the in the Burton film. Like I said, if you get two scenes with Cobblepot talking about running for mayor, you get a dinner scene between Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle and another scene where Bruce Wayne confronts Max Shrek and says he's going to fight him for the power plant. But then you get Selina Kyle blowing up Max <laughs> Shrek's store. Okay, great. But then you get Batman fighting her on the rooftop. There is equal balance in these films. The scales are balanced. Burton's Batman <laughs> films are both about Batman and the villain, and they're given equal time to develop on screen. Oh my huh. gosh. <laughs> what a very passionate argument from my colleague, Sam Ballard. Dude, I, I felt like halfway through that, I just needed to be like, I yield, I yield, I yield. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize I had all that stored up in there. <laughs> Yeah, man, you need to write a letter or something. Like, there's like, <laughs> you definitely uh, have had, you definitely needed to get that out, and you did, which we all very much appreciate. However, in the interest of time, yeah. I think instead of doing the normal three yeah. different um, agree or disagrees, we should just pick, uh, we'll, we'll just do this one last one. And because you did so well, I will let you, you can go ahead and pick this one first. Batman Sub-Zero is better than Batman Mask of this Phantasm. Disagree, disagree, disagree. Mask of the Phantasm by far has the greater villains, both in the Phantasm and in Mark Hamill's The Joker. You get a truly compelling storyline where you see Bruce Wayne actually begging his parents, you know, he finds happiness at one point in this film and he is truly happy and truly in love and he goes out to his parents grave and he begs his parents can I please can I just please give up this mission you know that I that I swore on your deathbed you know that it, not on your deathbed but <laughs> by your side in the alley that, that I would take up can I can I please just give money to fight this and the answer is no and this man is wrenched and heartbroken and he has to reject the love of his life and go on prowling the night doling out punishment but then all of a sudden you get this great villain in the phantasm who equals batman but is willing to go one step further in killing people and he and the phantasm starts taking apart the mob and then they turn to a man that they truly don't understand the joker and the joker goes insane on this one mark hamill lights up the screen and he has some great fights and some great scenes between both the Phantasm and Batman. And what makes it so scary is that Joker's even willing to go further than the Phantasm is just to get his way. Like, it is scary what that man is willing to do. The final amusement park fight scene is so fantastic. Batman Mask of the Phantasm always ranks in my top five favorite Batman films and is so underrated. Ha! <sighs> Batman Mask of the Phantasm. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go see it. Alex. <laughs> All right. Uh, first, uh, let me go ahead and say that I don't necessarily agree that Sub-Zero is better than Batman Mask of the Phantasm, but I do think that, you know, first and foremost, we have to establish that, that Victor Freeze is one of the top-tier Batman villains, especially the Batman animated series villains. He was always 
very, very well done, very well acted, very well written for, and he carries a certain amount of, um, what would you say, like, you can really sympathize with this character and his, um, his desire to reunite with his, with his, you know, the love of his life, his, you know, Nora, it, you know, and so we see in this, in this film, Sub-Zero, that he has, you know, started his own family, he has kind of isolated himself, and, and, and it is the interference of man that kind of forces his hand, and that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about this movie, was that um, he is a villain that didn't want to be in that position, he was kind of forced to be in that position because of his, his, uh, his wife's kind of condition and stuff, and the, the twist that, you know, Barbara Gordon was a perfect match for, for Nora as far as a, a, um, like a transplant, you know, the blood type and everything like that. So, um, stuff like that is what kind of really, uh, gave sub Batman sub zero, a lot of substance, you know, you had, of course, Robin was in it. It was fantastic to watch and to see it, you know, at the end, you know, I guess spoiler alert for what damn, damn near like 40 year old movie. Um, that, you know, his, his, uh, I think it's his son, his son, Kunak or whatever, his, that his adopted son is the one that kind of, um, it, he, uh, betrays him in the end, you know, and helps Barbara escape and everything like that. So it is, I felt like, like, uh, like Mask of the Phantasm is of course fantastic. However, it does run extremely long. I think I don't remember how long quite, but it is, you know, and and this this movie Sub Zero is, you know, sixty six minutes. You're in, you're out before you even know it, and you get you a, a nice good story with a, a fantastic um, Batman villain, and that's what I have to say about that. I don't care if that didn't fit the the criteria for arguing for it, but whatever, man. I wasn't given a whole lot to go with because I love Mask of the Phantasm. And I've only seen Batman Sub Zero like maybe once or twice. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Our segment covering episodic comic related programming has returned this week with Marvel's uh, What If. But if you're a fan of agree or disagree segment, don't fret. We plan on incorporating it in a regular. Regular monthly rotation, so send in your suggestion for topics now. Alex, uh, not bad defending Sub-Zero there, no. (laughs) (laughs) I tried, man. But hey, folks, moving from agree to disagree to What If, Episode 1 of Marvel Studios' new anthology series, What If, premiered on Disney Plus August 11th, and is titled... What if Captain Carter were the first Avenger? During World War II, Steve Rogers is chosen to become the world's first super soldier, but he is wounded by a Hydra spy before he can receive the super soldier serum. SSR agent Peggy Carter kills the spy and volunteers to receive the serum herself. She is successfully enhanced but banned from combat, combat by SSR leader John Flynn. After she steals the Tesseract from Hydra with a vibranium shield from inventor Howard Stark, Flynn reluctantly promotes her to the combat role of Captain Carter. Stark uses the Tesseract to create a weaponized armored suit for Rogers to pilot, known as the Hydra Stomper. Carter and Rogers fight many battles until he goes missing while attacking a Hydra train. Carter and her allies find Rogers when they infiltrate a Hydra base and see Red Skull using the Tesseract to open a portal and summon an interdimensional creature, which kills him. Carter enters the closing portal to force the creature back. Almost 70 years later, the Tesseract opens up another portal, which Carter emerges from meeting Nick Fury and Clint Barton. Alex, what are your thoughts on the first episode? Uh, I thought this was a really good um, kind of introduction to this show. Uh, I know that um, since the, I think, I believe chronologically, um, 
Captain America, the first Avenger, is the first, like, if you were to go back and watch the Marvel movies in chronological order, I think that first Captain America movie is the start. So I like that they were that they had um, chose that to kind of base off, uh, or to base this episode off of. I enjoyed um, Peggy Carter. I honestly think that if Captain Carter and Captain America fought, Captain Carter would probably whoop his ass because she she is like very noticeably stronger than than anything that um, Captain America has done so far. I mean, like I mean, just flipping a car over her and stuff like that is kind of kind of insane and um uh, i thought this episode was really good it was a great introduction to the show and i i definitely enjoyed it and i will be probably i'll give it another uh, definitely another episode at least I'll be, I'll be watching but what about you sam what did you think um it was it was generally fun like like you know like it, it, it didn't blow me away or anything but it was fun like like i i had popcorn I had, I had a good popcorn fun time with this episode. Uh, I thought the animation was kind of cool. Um, loved, I thought, I thought Howard Stark kind of, kind of stole the show there. Like, like, like in every scene he was in, uh, he was really funny and he was the young roguish Howard Stark, you know, that, that we've all seen from, you know, comics and, and movies. Um, yeah, no, uh, I didn't really get pulled into the episode until, uh, Carter and Rogers are sharing a whiskey and um, uh, Howard shows up and tries to pull them out on a night on the town with uh, him and uh, Bucky and also and he actually puts two and two together uh, and he says something akin to yeah you know just keep going and just act like I'm not here as he as he stares <laughs> at them through through the uh, through the bar window uh, once once that character development started uh, I really I really started liking it uh, more and more it was it was just fun to see like the you know as as it's called the the different what ifs you know like like uh steve went into the ice and you know carter went into a tesseract portal and like how they both kind of you know came out and, and everything um so yeah no uh kudos to the to the voice cast and uh yeah like i said i thought i thought it was a very very uh just fun episode um, the animation style is very striking to say the least. Do you like it, Alex? Do you not? And did anything surprise you about this episode? Uh, I will say the animation style definitely took a little bit, um, to get used to because, uh, you're so used to kind of this big budget kind of, you know, explosions and, and high, high octane action that they give you with the movies. And even on, um, especially with this episode, you know, it's different than something you would see on Agent Carter, although this is a lot like something you would see on Agent Carter. Um, but the animation style wasn't bad. I, I, I did enjoy it. I, I, and I am interested to see what they can do with it. I'd like to see them really just kind of take the gloves off if, and open up with it because you're not kind you're not held back by, the restraints of what a computer can do or what an actor in, a, in front of a green screen can do. You can, you can animate anything that you want. So I kind of want to see them animate anything that they want. Um, that being said, was there anything that surprised me this episode? Uh, definitely when, um, probably when, when, when Steve was the one that, that, uh, went into the ice uh, uh, during the Hydra train infiltration moment. That that definitely took me by surprise. And I also thought I thought that um, that because we we saw a lot of the footage uh, uh, in the uh, the trailer for this 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 uh, production when we saw uh, Agent Carter you know kind of wielding that sword and stuff. I thought that that was going to be Excalibur. I didn't think that it was just going to be some sword that she just found. <laughs> in the castle. So that was also a very big surprise for me. But what about you, Sam, uh, your thoughts on the, on the animation style and if anything was a, a you know, particular surprise to you from this episode? Uh, like you, the animation style took me a little bit to get used to, but overall I liked it. I, I, I thought it was a, uh, a, a fun styling, uh, no real surprises. Um, you know, like I said, I was just wondering, you know, like how, how is, how is that train scene going to play out? You know, like, like how, how is Peggy going to go into the ice, you know, per se? Um, 
I thought maybe, maybe we might get like a jump ahead in this episode and see and see Steve Rogers as the as the Winter Soldier. Uh, I thought I thought that would have been kind of like a, a cool what if. Uh, unfortunately, we we didn't get that. Um, but uh, you know that that would have been surprising, but like a a really fun surprise. But uh, no, beyond that, like I said, just a really fun episode. Just just fun to see. You know, kind of the opposite side of the coin there. Um, Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige explained with the series announcement that it would take pivotal moments from th throughout the MCU and change them. Um, Alex, with that in mind, do you have any predictions for future episodes? Um, let me think. Um, so, hold on. Okay. Oh, tin oh. foil hat here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Cracking one open and putting on the tinfoil hat. Let's go. I will say I think, well, because if he, if anybody has seen the the previews and kind of like um, and, and 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 stuff like that for this particular production, they know that Marvel Zombies will be an episode um, in the future. Here, I think there's ten episodes, so one of the ten of them is going to have to do with Marvel Zombies. And I, my prediction is that the Marvel Zombies episode is going to have something to do with the people that were snapped. I think it's going to be something along the lines of, like, what if the other people were snapped? And um, so then you have, you know, because, because in the preview we see Bucky is the one that is fighting against the zombie Captain America. So I would like to see something where it's like, you know, Tony obviously would have gotten snapped. Steve would have got snapped. Um, Thor would have got snapped. And you know, your Bucky's, your uh, your your Spider Man's, your, and your Doctor Strangers would have not been snapped. So I think they would have put together a plan to try and resurrect those who had been snapped. But uh oh, they don't. They're not as smart as Tony and can't put together some kind of time heist. And they end up trying to just necromancy through Doctor Strange, and they end up resurrecting the dead and turning them into zombies. That is my prediction. Wow. <laughs> or, that is my future <laughs> prediction for the episode, and I will stand by that. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam, I yield the floor and the rest of the remainder of my time to you, sir. Well, I'm about to put on my tinfoil hat and just <clears throat> go down my rabbit hole of what... I would like to see. Um, so part one would be, what if Darcy was worthy and picked up Thor's hammer? You know, <laughs> what would, what would, what would Jane's spunky little sidekick look like with the power of Thor imbued in her? I think, I think that could be funny. That could be hilarious. Um, you know, uh, do I think that's probably going to happen? Probably not. And, um, oh, abs absolutely <clears throat> not, but I will say, you know, my comic life, absolutely a pro Cat Dennings podcast. Oh yeah, we, we love Cat Dennings on the show, and we need to see more of Cat Dennings in the MCU. Uh, my other one, and uh, this one's really, once again, tinfoil hat going down the rabbit hole. What if Doctor Strange and Bruce Banner swapped majors in college, so Banner became the surgeon, and Strange became the gamma radiation scientist so what if dr strange ended up being the hulk and bruce banner ended up being <laughs> dr strange you know um just this eight foot tall sorcerer supreme <laughs> yeah 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 bench, it's eight foot. bench like the bench the statue <laughs> yeah basically yeah no they, yeah, that, that kind of came out of yeah <laughs> the avengers endgame meeting where banner met the sorcerers and i was like well happen if the hulk became dr strange you know or like what if they swapped you know um yeah so uh i know that like you never see them in college in the in the mcu but so uh, yeah it's just what if they swapped majors and <laughs> they went down a different 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 life paths uh that would that would be kind of kind of fun for me to see Anyway, it's absolutely wild. And I encourage you, you uh, listeners out there, please, you know, if you guys have any kind of weird um, theories or predictions for this show, please, you know, put them down in the comments. We read all your comments and we would um, be very thankful to to hear what some of you have to have to think about that. The, but uh, that being said, what would you rate this first episode of Marvel's What If, Sam? 
Uh, seven point five to an eight. I mean, like it was, it was just a fun episode. You know, I mean, like not bad by any means. You know, just I wasn't also just like you know, just blown away either. You know, but uh, yeah, it was, it was just a fun, fun episode. Uh, what, what about you? I, uh, I think you, you hit the nail in the head. So I think seven point five is a safe, uh, uh, kind of rating for this episode because it. Because it is based off of, you know, the first Captain America movie, which is kind of a 7.5 movie, I think that this is a 7.5 episode. I, I thought it was, a, you know, the humor was uh, really good. Like you said, uh, Howard Stark stole the show. Uh, I can't, you know, we can't, we honestly can't get enough of him because young Howard Stark is, is, he honestly deserves his own show. Um, but, uh, yeah, definitely... Uh, was enough to uh, pull me to watch the the next episode of this uh, anthology series, and uh, I I can't wait to see kind of what they what what you know kind of some of the storylines that they get into with this. All right, folks. Well, that wraps up another great episode of My Comic Life. As always, we sincerely appreciate you listening and spreading the word about the show uh we do have a facebook page you know my comic life uh get your friends get your family get anyone to like our facebook page also we have a youtube channel find us on youtube just by searching my comic life and looking for that oh so beautiful oh so stylish oh so awesome my comic life logo please like and comment and subscribe there that really helps us out it really helps grow the show Uh, If you have topics you want to hear us talk about, you know, our next agree or disagree, or hey, I want to hear you guys talk about this video game, or hey, what did you think about this comic book series? Email us. Email us at realmycomiclife at gmail.com. Again, just in case you missed it, that email address is realmycomiclife at gmail.com. Also, time to shout out to our My Comic Life Fan of the week, Alex Rogan from Telluride, Colorado. Sir, we thank you for liking our Facebook page and commenting on it. Alex Rogan, you are our My Comic Life Fan of the Week. Salute to you, Alex. Salute to you, sir. Alex, you have a really bitchin' name. (laughs) Yeah, great, great name there, Alex. Yes, Alex from Telluride, Colorado. Alex Rogan, thank you, sir. Uh, But this wraps up this episode of My Comic Life, guys. Again, thank you so much for listening. And as always, oh, shit, I'm sorry. Kevin Smith, I'm sorry. I meant to have you on to talk about the filming of Clerks 3's. Kudos for getting that off the ground. I'm sorry, man. Next week, next week, I (laughs) swear we're going to get you on this show. But for now, as always, folks, ditch the herd. Be a nerd. Stay strong out there, my friends.